So in this memorial of St. Charbel, it could be helpful for us to consider just what a giant of a saint this man was. He was somebody that he's respected and loved by people all over the Middle East and all over the world, in fact. Here at the grotto, we have this amazing shrine dedicated to him that you must have passed as you made your way here to the cave. In St. Patrick's Cathedral, they have a grotto, they have a sh uh, an altar of him as well. And you find churches in Latin America that are dedicated to St. Charbel as well, the Padre Pio of the East. He was a monk for 24 years in the monastery of Anaya. And he had this perfect observation of the rule in the monastery and this great austerity of life. But the last 23 years of his life, so he spent 24 years in a monastery, the last 23 he spent in a hermitage located above that monastery in Lebanon. His whole day was one of work, prayer, and worship. He would spend whole nights in adoration before our Lord in the Eucharist. And even though he only ate once a day, he did not excuse himself from that hard manual labor in the vineyard. You know, he would work alongside the novices, these other much more junior members of the monastery without any kind of complaint. He slept on the stone floor of his cell. And until the day of his death, he wore a hair shirt that covered his arms and torso, as well as this metal chain around his waist as a kind of penance, a way to make himself more like Christ crucified. And during his life, he would even perform miracles. Physical cures were attributed to him, as well as the casting out of the demons. And so people would come from far abroad to consult this holy man of God. So this is all very impressive, to say nothing of the non-stop stream of miracles which have taken place at his shrine through his intercession since his death in 1898. From the year 2008 to 2012, it's reported that there were 146 documented miracles which took place through his intercession. Those are the only ones they know of in the period of four years, 146. Now this leads us to a little bit of a problem insofar as he is this titan of a saint doing incredible deeds, living this very penitential life, but saints are supposed to be people that we imitate. We're supposed to look upon them as our role models. So how do you imitate somebody like that? How do you imitate somebody like Saint Charbel? It seems like he's just so distant from us because of his incredible spiritual practices, or he belonged to a different species, a, super, a race of supermen of some sort. So who of us could live like that, even if God called us to a hermetic vocation? Seems as if we can only hang our heads in shame by the fact that we're not nearly as holy as he was, or we just admire him from afar. But let's remember that the church does not just canonize people to make us hang our heads in shame that we're not as good as them. That's not the reason why we have saints. There are many things in his life that we can, in fact, imitate, even if we don't live exactly as he lived. For example, we can imitate his hard work and his discipline. This man who went out into the fields in days like today with his blazing sun, and he would work for hours on end. His concern for the, the, the people that were suffering that came to see him. And also his love for Mary. He would pray 15 decades of the rosary every day, and he would fast on Saturdays in her honor. So we can imitate any of his virtues, even if we don't do exactly what he did. But what makes St. Charbel really stand out? What makes him really exceptional, even amongst the saints? is his generosity with God. He was like the disciple in the gospel who gave up everything and followed Christ. Christ. He gave without counting the cost. He never said no to God. He never in his whole life held anything back from God. With his vow of poverty, he gave God his material possessions. With his vow of chastity, he gave God his body and the possibility of having a family. With his vow of obedience, he gave to God his will and his 
freedom to determine how he was going to live his life. With his penances, he sacrificed everything except that which was needed to sustain himself. And he gave up all of his time to serve the monastic community or to converse with God. Everything in him was God's. And because of his generosity, he received the promise of our Lord. A hundred times more than what he gave up in this life and eternal life in the age to come. And this generosity is something that we can imitate. Imitate it in keeping with our state in life. And we don't need to necessarily sleep on the stone floor if we have stone floors at our homes. We don't necessarily need to wear a hair shirt for our entire lives. We don't need to eat just once a day. If you can, great. But all of us can say yes to God, no matter what he asks, no matter what he might expect of us, no matter what comes our way, we can all say yes to God. Cheap souls never make it to heaven. We will never save ourselves if we continue to put limits on what we will give to God. And the devil knows this, and so the devil, he always tempts us to be reasonable about what we give to God. Reasonable in the sense of being timid, in the sense of being half-hearted. Reasonable in the sense of being stingy. The devil wants us to avoid total commitment to God. He wants us to draw these imaginary lines in the sand, saying, okay, I can give you this much God, but that's as far as I can go. Or he wants us to imagine that we have a right to those things that we expect. So for example, you come back from work, and you want some me time, something you expect. But nobody ever promised when you started a family that you would get me time. That was not part of the marital vows. But very often the devil will tempt us to get enraged, to lose our minds when we don't get these things that we imagine we have a right to. I have a right to a cup of coffee in the morning. I have a right to eight hours of sleep. But God might not be asking you to have that much sleep. So let us never put limits on what we will give him. We, in order to be saints, like Saint Charbel, we can imitate what Mary Magdalene did in the gospel. She came to our Lord with this expensive perfume made of nard, and she poured it all over our Lord's head and feet. She didn't simply take off the top and drip, put a few drops on him, that's what you normally do with perfume. You don't normally pour out copious amounts of it. She broke the container in order that there might be nothing left. That is how we are to live. We must break the container of our lives and pour everything into our Lord's hands, leaving nothing for ourselves. This is the way of the saints. This is the way of Saint Charbel. This is the way we are called to act as well. Another thing we can imitate of St. Charbel is his love of the Eucharist. With the Eucharist, God is generous with us. It is the greatest gift he can possibly give us. And so today, when we receive the Eucharist in Holy Communion, let us ask for that grace through the intercession of St. Charbel and Our Lady, who he loves so much, to be as generous with God as God has been with us.